the question form. And I would ask two things. One, please move into the aisle when you're ready to ask your question. And Bob will have the mic in this aisle and Dawn in this aisle. And they will hold the mic for you so that your question or comment will be heard. So please, when you're ready with a question, move into the aisle. <clears throat> Three. Secondly, please keep your questions concise and brief so that everyone that wants to can speak. So instead of long statements and summaries, please keep your comment and your questions short so that we can all enjoy it. All right, so we'll begin and um, just move in and start. Thank you. My name is Michael. Um, is this about teaching authority in the church? Anyone who says that you can have a one-sided coin is kind of living in a fantasy world, yet uh, that's exactly the world I think that many or some of our leadership live in. We all know our bishops and popes have authority to teach from God, but that's really only one side of the coin. If we were to pry off the solder and flip the coin over, we'd see the other side, and it's in the form of a question. What is the ultimate authority in the church? And I'd say it's not the bishops or pope, it's actually the truth as the ultimate authority. You could say in brackets, that's God. And who is capable of speaking the truth? Anyone who's moved by the Spirit. Now, if there are enough bishops who actually believe that, then I think we have a chance of changing our church. But if there are more bishops than not who say, no, authority is all about your position of leadership, then I think we've got real problems. So could you comment on that, please? Well, look, I think you've described the situation very well. I mean, Catholicism, structurally, is a hierarchical tradition. There's just no getting around that. Uh, and so you've got the Pope at the top and the bishops, and they're believed to be invested with authority to teach, preach, and govern, right? But there has always been a charismatic dimension to Catholic life as well um, that has precious little to do with hierarchical authority and often is an outright opposition to it. Right? I mean, much of the creative energy in the Catholic Church in the last two or three centuries certainly did not come because some pope in Rome pushed a button. I mean, you know, why did we get the great burst of teaching orders that, that grew up, mostly women, uh, in the 19th century? Okay, because there was a perception that the realities of industrial, industrialization were making old models of education obsolete. There was an, a need to invent some new apostolic model to respond to it. Uh, and creative, dynamic women did that. Uh, and they did not sit around waiting for approval. Uh, and of course, you know, there was this great model in Catholicism of people who were seen as renegades and troublemakers in their own lifetime later being canonized. I, you know, uh, I think of Mother Seton in the United States, right? You know, our famous, uh, in, you know, Catherine Ann Seton, um, who, when she arrived in the Archdiocese of New York, was told by Archbishop Dagger John Hughes to go home because he didn't have any need of her. Uh, and she said, no, I think that's okay. I think we're going to stay. Uh, and she bought property on her own, and of course, within 10 years, was wrapped in a warm, loving embrace by the archdiocese, if it had been their idea all along. Uh, you know, why did we get, uh, you know, the social teaching? Uh, that, of course, flowered in the late 19th century uh, with the uh, Rerum Novaris from Leo the 13th. But, uh, you know, the origins of that were in a widespread perception among Catholic pastors that the church was, lurking, was losing the working classes. I mean, basically, there is a sense that we had lost the educated elite to secularism, um, and we were now losing the working class to socialism or communism or something like that uh, because the church wasn't in any compelling way answering their questions. You know, the groundspring of that social teaching was in the reflection, the theological work and so forth that had been done by people outside the hierarchy, which with time, the wisdom of that was seen by the hierarchy and integrated. 
you know, why did we get the great flowering of the lay movements in the 20th century? I mean, you know, we're talking about Schoenstatt and Larsch uh, and the neocatechumenate and the San Egidio community and uh, the Jerusalem community, the Emmanuel community, on and on. Uh, it is not. Uh, because this was dreamed up uh, in a PowerPoint presentation in a Vatican corridor somewhere. Okay, uh, it's because charismatic lay Catholics, I mean, let's take the example of the Focolare. Uh, a lay Catholic woman uh, by the name uh, of Chiara Lubick, um, who was living in Trent uh, at the time of the Second World War, and Trent was one of the cities in Italy hardest hit by the war, and then basically the city was in rubbles, in rubble. Uh, and after the war, she decided there was a need for a new form of Catholic spirituality that would be lay-led and that would be premised on the unity of the human family, that would seek to promote, promote human, uh, unity in all of its forms. Uh, they quickly became experts in ecumenical and interfaith dialogue, for instance. To this day, they have one of the most long-standing and successful Christian Muslim dialogues in the world. Um, they became engaged in conflict resolution uh, and any number of other issues. Uh, and you could say the same thing about the community of San Egidio, which just does marvelous work on so many fronts, uh, including these days care for migrants and refugees. Um, you know, when Pope Francis went to the Greek island of Lesbos uh, and brought back 12 Syrian refugees with him. Okay. He didn't turn them over to some official Vatican office to take care of them. Uh, he asked the community of San Egidio to do it. Um, and they put them through their immersion language school, uh, helped them find homes and jobs. Salam <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I just had the occasion to interview several of them the other day. They are flourishing uh, in Italy now. Uh, it would astonish you how much their kids are Italian natives. I mean, it's just hilarious. Like, they speak perfect street Italian, you know? Um, and they know exactly which squadra di calcio, you know, which soccer team they cheer for. Stuff like that. Um, a, and again, this is not because the Vatican wanted there to be lay movements. Actually, at the beginning, there was tremendous opposition, right? Uh, and there were various efforts to squelch these things and rein them in and deny them permission and all sorts of, of other things. And, you know, here we are 50, 60, 70 years later, and once again, uh, they have become, you know, part of the officialdom in a sense, right? I mean... The Pope, every year, does a big shindig for the lay movements uh, in St. Peter's Square on the Feast of Pentecost. You know, nothing happens these days uh, at the Vatican without the lay movements, one way or another, being involved in it. Uh, and the point is, all of this was an example of the charismatic dimension of the church. Okay? Uh, seeing a need, inventing models to respond to it, and then over time, trying to make its peace with officialdom, right? Um, and to me, that's how this works, okay? I mean, as a, a friend of mine, Father Robert Taft, probably the Catholic Church's single greatest expert on Eastern liturgy, Taft had a saying about life in the Catholic Church, which was, if you want to swim in the Catholic pool, 
sooner or later, you're going to have to make your peace with the lifeguard. <laughs> Meaning, you know, you can't pretend the bishops are going away. Okay, uh, you know, Episcopal leadership, hierarchical governance is part of the DNA of Catholicism. Uh, effective charismatic leadership um, doesn't spurn that on principle. Uh, effective charismatic leadership um, it, it accepts it on principle, but push, pushes that leadership relentlessly to make space for what these charismatic groups are seeing and doing. So you are quite, first of all, let me affirm the premise of your question. You are quite right. The ultimate authority in the Catholic Church is not the Pope. The ultimate authority in the Catholic Church is God as revealed in his son Jesus Christ. Okay, uh, And the Pope, just like everyone else in the Church, uh, is answerable uh, to that deposit. Right? Um, However, uh, on the other hand, that doesn't make popes and bishops ir irrelevant. You know, at the end of the day, somebody's got to make decisions. And I've been covering the Catholic Church, man and boy, for 20 years. Most days, I get down on my knees and thank a loving God that that person who has to make decisions is not me. <laughs>